Welcome to Crypto Kid Podcast. So today I have a special guest. She is a CTO and and a, a Bitcoin and um, not Bitcoin, but blockchain enthusiast. And she's here to give us some advice about how businesses could get involved with blockchain technology, even though it's a little bit scary at first, but she'll go over and how to make you feel more comfortable. So why don't you give a quick introduction of yourself and how you got involved with blockchain technology? Hey there, uh, really nice to be on this podcast. Thanks for having me. My name is Meta Parlakar, and I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders of Casper Labs. Uh, Casper Labs is a company that built the Casper Network. It's a public layer one blockchain protocol that supports smart contracts. And I fell into the blockchain rabbit hole, if you will, my, my origin story, if you will, in crypto, um, is in 2017, <clears throat> a friend of mine uh, who knows that I know how to build and drive engineering teams needed an engineering leader or program leader for an open source blockchain project. And that really introduced me to the technology. It was, oh my gosh, I'm going to say early 2017. And I worked on that project for about a year and a half, about a year, a little over a year, like 14 months. And then that project went belly up when the 2018 bust happened, you know, during crypto winter. And that's when I was approached by the other co-founders of Casper Labs to co-found uh, Casper Labs and to build Casper. Awesome. That's amazing. So what is your role at Casper Labs as a CTO? What do they have you doing? So I'm the chief technical officer, one of the founders. So I was here, you know, from day one, and I'm really the person behind the vision of the Casper network. Uh, you know, what its purpose was, the core features, right? So uh, built the engineering team, right? And is responsible for product and technology and research. So research and development, product and technology, the whole the whole ball of wax. Amazing, amazing. So one of my questions is, the people say that Bitcoin and blockchain technology is not really, it's not something that they feel comfortable with. And that, that ever since like what would happen with FTX, with Sam and every and everything else, really turn them off. But I've been trying to explain to them why is Bitcoin here to stay? And they just, it goes way over the head. Maybe if I show them like a professional that's founded a company, can you explain to me why is Bitcoin here to stay in your perspective? Yeah, I, I'm going to frame it in a very different way mm -hmm. um, than most people would. Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is money for computers. So the current banking infrastructure and the current fiat, what we call fiat banking infrastructure was never designed. Those rails were never designed to support transactions and commerce at the scale that is happening today, right? So if you think about it, if I'm trying to buy or sell goods internationally, it takes me over three weeks to get a letter of credit to do so. That doesn't work in an e-commerce world. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work when I go to Apple or I go to Dell and I want to buy a computer and I want to see that computer land on my doorstep in three or four days, right? Sourcing the supply to build that computer, it's coming from a different world, right? So in this global, highly distributed, technologically backed commerce system, you cannot use the current banking infrastructure. So coming up with a form of digital currency, right, is was inevitable, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It was only a matter of time that innovation was going to step in and say, you know what, the current banking infrastructure is too slow, it's too expensive, it's too inefficient, we need to find a better way. And that's why I think Bitcoin is going to be here to stay. And Bitcoin may ultimately not be like, I, I'm not a Bitcoin maxi, I do think Bitcoin is here to stay. But I would say is, Bitcoin may not be the ultimate digital currency that bootstraps commerce, retail commerce in the final analysis, but I do believe it'll be a non-trivial participant in the global economy moving forward, you know, in the next 10 to 12 to 15 years. I think it's a very slow process. I think that it's going to take time, but I absolutely believe that blockchain technology is here to stay. Uh, the current banking infrastructure has no options. Like there's no alternative, right? So to 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 blockchain technology. So now when Bitcoin first came out in the blockchain, 
it was it's decentralized and do you think too much decentralized is can cause chaos and there's like no rules to be played i think there's a place for it right mm -hmm. so you know, if you're familiar with BitTorrent, BitTorrent's, I'm familiar with BitTorrent. BitTorrent's mm -hmm. been around for like 30 years. It's not going anywhere. Oh, okay. It never went, right? Despite, uh, I, I, you know, I worked at mp3.com. I was part of the digital music revolution, if you will. We mm -hmm. foresaw the people at mp3.com. We built YouTube back in 1999. We foresaw iTunes and Shazam and all those things, right? Digital music streaming. And while Napster was able to shut down because it was centralized, BitTorrent was never shut down. It still isn't shut down, right? So I think that there's definitely something to be said for a decentralized, permissionless technology. I feel that it will be here to stay. How it evolves and the governance mechanisms by which Bitcoin continues to be relevant, right? Because while Bitcoin may obsolesce traditional banking infrastructures, it needs to be careful that it also doesn't become a victim of obsolescence itself because it's not able to make the necessary updates, right? And that's really up to the Bitcoin community and their ability to ensure that the protocol uh, does remain future-proof, right? It is able to keep up with uh, technological change, right? Like people talk a lot about quantum with respects to crypto. I actually think if quantum comes out, our least of our problems is crypto, uh, but it's definitely something that, uh, you know, that we need to, you know, pay attention to. I I concur completely. Now, how does blockchain impact my existing data infrastructure and IT tooling? So here's the way I like to think about it is, you know, the end user doesn't know if they're using Apache web server or TCP IP or, you know, Microsoft.net server or AW. They don't know. They don't care. Uh, the same thing is going to happen with blockchain. Nobody's going to care about which blockchain they're using. All they're going to care is the value they extract from it, right? All I'm going to care is if I'm using a zero knowledge proof to prove that I'm over the age of 21, that I don't need to show them my home address and my date of birth and all this other information that isn't germane or relevant to whether or not I can enter a bar, right? So I think in the final analysis, nobody's really going to care about blockchain technology. People are going to get the benefits of it. And we believe it's going to be through enterprise, right? And that's where making sure that the technology works with all the software that's ever been built comes into play. And you'll hear from a lot of blockchain projects that, well, if you want to use blockchain, you got to rip everything out and start over with a whole new Web3 paradigm. Mm. And... I don't think that's tenable. Nobody's throwing out what they built over the past 20 years to start over, right? Things don't start over. They incrementally improve. You, They add, they test, they check, right? But nobody throws out what they used before. So I think that we need to reframe how people are thinking about blockchain technology to realize that ultimately users will use it and they won't even know they're using it. That is so true. That is so true. And that's going to happen worldwide here shortly. It, the days are numbered. I believe that with all my heart. Now, will my data be secure and have transparency? I think the technology is there to offer data security and transparency as well. Um, using blockchain technology, I believe that there is some work to do to be done around computation and ZK proofs, but we're starting to see real scalable technology emerge in the space. So. Yeah, absolutely. There isn't a reason why you can't have data sovereignty, you know, in a in a new brave, you know, uh, Web3 world, for sure. It's just going to take time. It's not going to happen quickly. I think we're still five to seven years away. But there are there is research and development and new technologies being built to support the the big idea. OK, OK. Thank you for explaining that. Now, I own a I own a boat detailing business and I want to I want to apply cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies to to my business and I'm having I'm having a website built so what are some use cases for my business if I do jump to blockchain technology in cryptocurrency in boat detailing huh boat that's detailing. pretty cool well so definitely you know reputation is a big thing that lives on the blockchain right so for example 
-hmm. you can benefit from a reputation in that, well, is this person that I'm going to go do their boat? Like, what is their reputation? How do they work with other vendors? Is this somebody that's trustworthy, right? You can go and look at their reputation of the blockchain as an example. The other thing you could look at is reputation of the people that you're going to be employing. If you're employing people to do boat detailing and they're going on these really expensive yachts, you want to know that this person is trustworthy. Have they done this before? If they worked at a car detailing place, did they work there for one year, three months, five years? How long did they work there for? Do they have like a provable reputation or provable experience that you can go look at the blo at the blockchain, right? Of course, the obvious one that people would default to is crypto payments, right? That's fairly obvious. Mm -hmm. But I like to think about things that don't necessarily need, you know, that the step outside of just payment infrastructure, because everybody can think about, anybody can think about payment infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like there's interesting things to be, do, to be done around loyalty, around reputation, around incentive design, around, you know, referrals, right? That you can use or rewards that you can use the blockchain for. Okay, okay. Now, now that leads me to my next question. So I was thinking about what you said about hiring a, like trustworthy employees. I want to, I want my ro I want robots to actually do the detailing for me. I'm tired of looking for people. I'm tired of training. And I've been recently looking at DAOs or DOAs. So that's um, AI and robot technology. To, that's going to take away a lot of manual labor from the workforce now. Mm -hmm. And, so what do you what do you think about going to that route? I think it's absolutely viable to uh, to use uh, those those kinds of technologies to help alleviate the lift right from mm -hmm. for human labor. I think they are still pretty far away from being effective enough that they can mm -hmm. effectively eliminate human labor, right? Um, I believe AI will support and make what we do as humans a lot more effective, a lot more efficacious, right? So you can do more. And that's what you see with chat GPT, right? Like chat mm -hmm. GPT doesn't necessarily replace a human being, but like if I want to run my essay through it and see what kind of output it gives me or how it helps me be the best version of my own ideas of what it is I'm looking to do, it's very effective. And that's what we're seeing a lot of the real world application of AI is really augmentation, right? So I feel like that there could be perhaps robots that could go on the bottom part of the boat and clean that surface, right? Using like sonar and other technologies you could kind of integrate where you could submerge them. And then they could do that work that humans can't. So it's accretive, right? But mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily want a robot doing the really delicate parts like cleaning the fiberglass because you don't want them scratching it or you wouldn't want mm -hmm. them doing like the state rooms, for example, in a really expensive yacht. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a right tool for the right use case, right? And so I think that there are definitely opportunities where this could work. Yeah, for sure. I'm glad you brought up chat GBT. Now, there's there's like going to be a lot of homework situations at universities using that. It's considered cheating. And some in my landlord's opinion, He's like, oh no, that's going to be considered cheating. So, what do you what do you think about that? Um, it's it's definitely it's definitely on the on the lines of cheating, right? But this is ultimately going to be the challenge that is inevitable, right? Like mm -hmm. back in the day, you could have cheated, like before the internet, you could have cheated by asking your brother that was in college to help you with your calculus homework, as an example, right? Now is that technically cheating because your brother, yeah, I mean, that's how long back does that go? Like forever, right? Like mm -hmm. how many times have you heard that? Oh yeah. The, the bully made the smart kid do his homework, right? It's like so cliche, even it comes in movies. So I think that, 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 you know, being allowed to, being able to use somebody to do the work for you is not a new concept, right? The challenge is scale, right? Like now it's completely accessible to everybody, right? It's not like it, not like it didn't happen before. It absolutely did happen before. But the scale is another matter now, right? Now it's easily accessible. It's very effective. It's, you know, widely, widely accessible. And I think that it's going to be a real challenge for 
uh, for people, for, for teachers to really going to be able to assess. I maintain that homework should not necessarily be graded, right? Like assessments will still happen in the classroom where your test scores will what's, be what's mattered, but probably homework won't have any weight in your final assessment, right? Because you're not, you know, what you're going to have to do the work honestly, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the only way you can really measure performance then is make the test scores the only thing that matters. All right. In a now, controlled environment. Yeah. So how do you, how do you use your team and developers to know how to implement blockchain technology? So the question you're asking me is how did we build the Casper protocol? Uh, yeah, is yeah, that, yeah, yeah, or exactly. are you talking about how, or how we build on the Casper protocol? Cause we do both. You can, you can explain both. Okay. Go for it. All right. Sounds good. So there are some essential components in a blockchain, right? In, in the mm -hmm. underlying distributed ledger technology. So you have to have a networking layer. You have to have a storage, multiple layers of storage where you store the blockchain data. And then you have to have a virtual machine that commun that, that basically processes smart, if you're building a smart contract platform. So you have to have a virtual machine or like, you know, people know the Ethereum virtual machine. Some people use a WebAssembly virtual machine. So you first, you have to define like, what are the components of the system, Right. And then you start designing the components of the system by doing some business analysis requirements. Like, for example, you have to have a notion of accounts. You have to have a notion of, you know, validators or peers. You have to have a notion of read-only peers. You have to have a notion of blocks. You have to have a notion of, right? So notionally, you know, these are all the pieces of the system, kind of like when you build a car, right? So you're like, okay, I've got this piece. I've got this piece. I got this piece. And then you go and you find engineers that have expertise in those areas, right? So mm -hmm. we found engineers that had expertise in consensus and researchers that had expertise in consensus. Then we found we found engineers that could actually build that kind of a system with a you know custom virtual machine and that people that could build a server, which is the node. And then you know you put them together and they each start building out their systems and then you have a core architecture that brings them all together. And then as soon as you have something that will run, you start running it right away. You start building it. You start running it. You start testing it. You start basically, you know, imagine like a little baby that eventually it's born and it starts to roll over, crawl, walk, run, and then, you know, grow. And so that's how software grows, right? It starts mm -hmm. with this idea. And then you, you basically analyze what are the pieces of the software, the core idea, and then you basically start thinking, okay, I need a database. I need this. I need this. I can need all these pieces. And you just put it together and you build a prototype. And then you go from the prototype and you add more functionality and capability until you get to what's called a minimum viable product. So we launched the Casper protocol in March of 2021. Mm -hmm. It took us about two and a half years to build. We started building in January of 2019, founded the company in October of 2018. We did a fair bit of prototyping we actually built an entire prototype in Scala and we threw that out and then we started all over again um, in Rust and we built a whole new brand, new Rust node in about a year mm -hmm. with the existing virtual machine that we had built. So it allowed us to take everything we learned from a prototype and then build it cleanly, right? In a single, in a single language architecture. And then now that we've deployed the Casper network, we're building solutions and applications and products on top of the technology. Some cool but, things like NFTs, NFT marketplaces yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, metaverses and games and all these really cool, uh, enable, you know, kind of blockchain enabled applications that consumers can then use, right? End users. Right, right. Now, all that sounds really expensive when you talk about engineering and, and developers. So how do you fit that in your budget? So the way it works is um, we rose a traditional equity round, right? So we went and we did, we raised some capital. Uh, Casper Labs is not really, it's not a token funded project, right? It's a pure traditional equity. And so we budgeted, you know, this is how many engineers we needed to build out all of these things. And then we went out and we hired those engineers. And my bias is always towards hiring the best, smartest people that can, can get the job done. I find that very, very important to hire really, really smart people that want to do great things and you just let them do it, mm -hmm. right? You just let them go. You tell them, this is what we need to go build and they just build it, right? 
and you tell them this is what it needs to do and they figure out how the system's going to work and they go create it. And that type of relationship I find works really, really well with engineers because engineers don't want to be told what to do. They want to be told what to create. And so if you give them a vision and you tell them, hey, this is what we think the system needs to do and here's why, go build it. They love going and creating that, right? And then the business can go ahead and sell that technology to customers who use it, which again, make engineers really, really happy. Engineers want to see their code being used, right? And so, yeah, that's that's the way I like to run our engineering organization. That This is the kind of the model I like to use. Amazing. And it gives you something to feel proud about. Like, yeah, I did that. You know, I contributed. I contributed and I put a few few um dents in the universe and who knows what will come out in the future absolutely that's right i mean i feel like every single person has creativity they want to express right and you want to express your creativity in your work and so it's an incorrect notion to think that software development and software engineering can't be a creative art it absolutely can be a creative art right you just need to find a company that has that way of working, that allows you to have the creativity to solve those problems and create new solutions that are exciting for you. And I believe that if you create that environment, engineers will naturally thrive, right? They will want to do more and more and grow and learn. Having a good company culture makes people want to stay and work harder if they see that they're appreciated. Now, will it actually help you overcome important business changes? You know, I think so. I think, you know, one of the core tenants that we hire for is people that are, you know, they're smart, but they're also flexible, right? They can read a room, they can understand like, this is how, this is what the situation is and how things are changing. And so a lot of the programmers we hire, they may have a lot of strength and rust, but that doesn't mean they haven't worked in C++. That doesn't mean they haven't been able to do other things. So we like to hire people that have a broad range of skills, right? Because we're still a small company. Um, we, we're not like the engineering team is 45 people, which is fairly large for an engineering team, if you think about it in terms of the crypto space. But broadly speaking, 45 is still a pretty small number, right? And so people have to wear multiple hats. And mm-hmm. so having that flexibility, I believe in your technical organization is really, really important because if the company has to shift direction, we need to, we want to retain our staff and make sure that they can do more than one thing, right? So really being able to do multiple things is really, really important in a culture. Now, when you're going and trying to get people to listen about your company, is it hard convincing them about the opportunities that blockchain brings to their businesses? So this is where I would say that the entire FTX and Terra Luna thing has really hurt us. Mm. Um, Businesses really don't trust blockchain right now because they have conflate they have basically combined crypto and blockchain together right and so the challenges we're facing we were never really affected directly by ftx but indirectly we're hearing a lot of blowback right because you're like oh you're a crypto project you have a token it's like well no the token is there to secure the public network and the security guarantees you get from a public network are really really important right Mm. here's the reason why they're important but we're swimming upstream against this anti-crypto narrative because of people like Sam Brank from Freed, right? That just really went in and poisoned the well for everybody that's trying to build and deliver legitimate value in the space, right? Like he's really done re- a lot of harm. And so, because they're like, oh yeah, it's just a bunch of Ponzi schemes or, oh yeah, it's just a bunch of, you know, untrustworthy people that are just going to rip off, you know, the retail investor. And so that's a real challenge. It's a real challenge we're we're dealing with. Um, and I think that, you know, us being a private for-profit company that can also work with private blockchains, we can support enterprises is, is, is how we're going to help kind of work around, you know, this narrative of, you know, crypto is a bad thing, right? I think, in my opinion, I think the FTX and the Luna is a good thing because it gives an opportunity or it gives a chance for the bad players to get out of the game and to have more, to have more, uh, what is it? How do you say it? 
it, for like regulation to have more regulation oversee with what's going on in the crypto community before it just goes out of control. I mean, Bernie Madoff pulled it off in a very regulated, mm -hmm. a very regulated environment, right? So it's not like it doesn't happen even in a regulated environment. It does, right? The difficulty is, is that industry is just painting a broad brush, brush right? So mm -hmm. we, we will need to remind them that, hey, you know, in 2008, AIG collapsed, right? Bernie Madoff pulled off his scam. And so it's not like it doesn't happen in traditional finance. It does, right? So they just, people tend to have amnesia, right? Like they don't think further back than six months. And I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, the whole FTX thing is still fresh and top of mind of people's in people's heads. And there's a narrative, like as it is, I feel like they're trying to push, push, you know, public blockchain down. And this just kind of adds fuel to the fire. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like sensible regulation will help the adoption of the technology. So I am, I'm very much open to it in favor of it. Yeah, it, we need to hold people accountable for their wrongdoings. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. So what's next for Casper Labs? We're really focused on bringing enterprises, you know, all along, right? We want to help mm -hmm. them build really cool uh, applications that they can give consumers the benefit of blockchain technology, right? So we want to work with companies that support businesses and support consumers and help them expose their consumer base to the benefits of blockchain technology through new features and new value offerings, right? So that's what we're fully focused on. Um, of course, the public protocol is also front of mind, and we're working really hard on Casper 2.0. Um, we're looking to ship Casper 1.5 really shortly, and 2.0 is slated for 2023, which I'm really excited about. We'll be upgrading our consensus protocol, mm -hmm. and we're going to be one of the few, very few blockchain projects that will be you know, upgrading their consensus protocol very shortly after launch. So I'm really excited about 2.0. Now, can you share exact date when it drops or not yet? I can't share an exact date. Like we're okay. targeting Q3, but these things are hard. You know, blockchains mm -hmm. are really hard to build and there's a lot of value locked in blockchain, right? So we have a responsibility to every single token holder and every single DAP developer and every single project that's built on Casper to make sure that whatever code we release, whatever code that we propose to the community is rock solid, right? So uh, we will make sure that the community understands everything that we're proposing to be built, as well as they understand that how thoroughly everything is tested. So we don't take it very lightly. We don't take it lightly. We're very diligent in our uh, qualification process to make sure that the code is ready for prime time. All right. All right. Now, I know, is there anything you feel like we didn't go over that you want to cover? No, I mean, it's your podcast. I mean, I'm just here to support you. <laughs> I really appreciate you. And how can people get a hold of you? Come find us on casperlabs.io. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at M uh, for Meta Parlicar. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. So um, we're on Telegram. We have a Discord. If you go to the website, you can find all our social channels. Mm -hmm. And I'm always available to answer questions. So don't hesitate to reach out. Amazing. And I'll put all those links in the description. And yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy woman and dealing with blockchain technology and engineers, and it's an honor to have you on the show. And I really wish you the best with your endeavors. And maybe we, uh, I would like to catch up later on in the future and maybe get some tea or drink if we ever crash into each other at the event, cryptocurrency event. So that would be amazing. That sounds great. I would look forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for All having right. me on. Take care and have a good night or day, wherever you're at. <laughs> I'm in Puerto Rico. So good night for me. Cheers. Okay. Night. Good night.